right. Hello, and uh, welcome to the community conversation about healing from racial trauma. This is Ahmad Ward. I'm the Vice President of Education and Exhibitions for the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, and we're live at the Institute. Thanks to all of you who are joining us on YouTube Live and also on Facebook Live uh, for this important conversation. The backdrop for this conversation is obviously uh, the 53rd anniversary of the commemoration of the bombing of 16th Street Baptist Church. Today's the day, uh, 53 years ago, that four girls were killed going to church at 16th Street Baptist Church right after Sunday school, getting ready to go into the choir. Later that day, you had two young men that were shot and killed in separate instances here in the city of Birmingham. So there was actually six children that lost their lives on September 15th. And what we want to talk about today is the trauma that goes along with incidents like that and how we can start to heal from trauma that still revolves around racial incidents and things that have been passed down through generations right now in 2016. And so, if you think about 53 years ago, when those young people who were friends and, and family of uh, Denise McNair, uh, Carol Robinson, Cynthia Wesley, and uh, name just jumped right out of my head, how about that? <laughs> Denise McNair, Carol Robinson, Cynthia Wesley, and uh, McNair. Denise McNair. McNair. Thank you. <coughs> this is live. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about this all day. Uh, those young people who were going to class with these four girls, uh, they didn't have any counselors at school waiting for them the next day. Uh, they didn't have any people to talk to them about what it would be like, this vacuum that's been left from their loved one, their friend, their classmate, people they've known since they've been alive their whole life, that's no longer there. That was not there for them. You know, when things happen now, the schools are really in-depth about setting out counselors to get people to talk to young people so that they can continue to move forward and maybe repair some of the loss. But that was not there for those young people. It was not there for the families. It was not there for the parents 53 years ago. And we want to look at how that might affect somebody right now um, in this present day with things we've seen with police brutality, stuff we see with incidents that are happening in places like Chicago. How do we move past? How do we learn from how do we continue to grow after bad things happen to us. So today we have a great panel with us. We have Dr. Nadia Richardson, who's the Associate Director for the Office of Diversity and Multicultural Affairs at UAB, and also the founder of No More Martyrs, which is a mental health awareness campaign. And also Dr. Artie Nelson, who's been a therapist in the area for about 32 years or so, has private practice, and has dealt with these issues um, for years. And so we're going to have a conversation today about this, and we're going to see if we can maybe help somebody who is dealing with some of these issues now. Because we, we've framed it with people who are associated with four girls, maybe the two little boys. But when incidents like these happen, it affects anybody. And so there are folks that don't have a direct correlation uh, to those people who are dealing with those same issues just because they saw it on TV, they read about it in a book, they see it in the newspaper, and those things affect us differently. So what I would like to do first is give uh, Dr. Richardson a chance to talk a little bit about No More Martyrs and why you started that campaign, and then we'll go to Dr. Nelson and just give us some, some background about how trauma affects us, both mentally and physically. So Dr. Richardson, if you give us a little bit of background about your organization. Sure, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here too. I really appreciate Absolutely. the opportunity to talk specifically on this day, but also talk and advocate on behalf of the mission of No More Martyrs. So No More Martyrs is a mental health awareness campaign that seeks to build a community of support for black women. And it's actually an organization that has grown very organically from a group of women who have developed a support system for themselves through social media. So I can tell you in 2014, Karen Washington, who was an online presence, she was a blogger um, and had a blog called For Brown Girls, um, we lost her to suicide. 
And it was a phenomenal blog, right? She talked about her own um, bouts of depression and anxiety, but she specifically pushed back against things that she felt like impacted her. Um, she spoke about female representation in hip hop music. She talked about unrealistic expectations of women, and she talked about racial injustice. And she talked about how those things can impact your mental well-being. Um, and we lost her, and it was hard, and it was a hard loss. And for someone like me, who was already engaged in research related to mental health and specifically mental health in black women, um, I started seeing a lot of conversations taking place online. You know how we do on social media. People start talking and commenting. You know, there's all the sorts of things like, how could this happen? She was beautiful, which she was a very beautiful young lady. Um, she was educated, college educated. She had this blog, she had an online following, and she was so inspirational to so many women. How could we lose her this way? And for me, I just thought, well, what do you think mental health looks like? You know, I think that there's this idea that it's always going to be someone who's broken down, who's crying and balled up in a corner, who has no education and no ability to contribute to the world, and it's not that. It's someone that could be the CEO of a company. It could be someone homeless on the street. And we need to acknowledge that we don't know what her reasonings were, and we don't know what her pain um, involved. Um, but we do know that we need to have these conversations on an ongoing basis and not just when something happens. I felt like we were talking about her in that moment, but we weren't going to be when something else happened. You know, in the next two weeks, the next headline comes onto the news, we weren't going to be talking about it anymore. So it started off as a Facebook page. It started off as a simple page where we can come together and talk about mental health specifically in black women, share resources, um, support each other, let someone know that they can log on and you know, if they're having a bad day, get support from other women who understand the experience. And in no time, we had over a thousand women following us online. Um, some of them were individuals living with mental health concerns, and some of them were practitioners that said, I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen a group that was specifically dedicated to black women. I've never seen a group that talked about mental health in this way, um, and that really challenged uh, social inequality and the impact that it has on mental health. So from there, we said, you know what, this is going into something new and exciting. Let's start a nonprofit. And that nonprofit led to online webinars, free online webinars that have been um, blasted out nationally and internationally. We've got great support. Um, we hosted our first uh, Minority Mental Health Awareness Summit this past July and have already received two grants, and that's just in one year of existence. And so I'm excited about the potential of this group, but first and foremost, I'm excited about what I see every time I log on. Every time I log on, there's a woman that says, I'm going through this. And now she has a sisterhood, over 4,000 women now who follow us online that can jump in and say, I hear you, I've got you, we've got your back, you've got support. Um, and we have a, an advisory committee of practitioners, mental health providers, who we can bounce ideas off of and who have successfully mediated two suicidal ideation through social media. And that's wow. just in one year. Wow. So it's a beautiful um, uh, organization that I'm very proud of and excited to be able to facilitate. I can't even say, you know, I don't even say that this is something I created. I, I feel like these women have genuinely said, this is what we need, this is what we want. And I said, okay, let's make it happen. That's amazing. And we need more uh, organizations like that. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that's special. And, and Dr. Nelson, I'm gonna get you to help me um, with this. You've been a uh, practitioner for a while. Can we talk a little bit about the effect that trauma can have on us uh, in our holistic body. And also, what I'd like to see if we can talk about is why it's a barrier for people of color. You know, there's, it's like a, a stigma, four-letter word, talking about getting help or counseling with our communities, and it's been like there for a while. And we want to see, you know, why do we think that is, or what can we do to kind of to combat that? So if you will start with just telling how trauma can affect us in ways just beyond the mental. Well, again, thanks for having me um, on this historic occasion. Um, I always say that I am here because of what had happened in Birmingham. And um, I have moved here from Los Angeles. And uh, give you a little background. Uh, the child and adolescent psychiatry program for many years did not address diversity issues or, or anything to do with race. It was sort of just, you had this illness, this was a book we looked into, and we put you on this medication. I got into it um, being a, a pediatrician first and saw a lot of kids in Los Angeles that were suicidal, had taken overdoses in the emergency room. And I was just sort of wondering, and these were African-Americans, Latino, 
all, all um, ethnic groups. I was just wondering, you know, why, why were they feeling so sad? What was going on? And I didn't have enough time as a pediatrician to, to do that. So I kind of went back to see by doing child psychiatry what was going on in their minds. So that was kind of my introduction to it. Happened to train at King Drew Medical Center in Watts, so I saw a lot of the trauma back then from the um, gang violence. And we would talk to these kids about what they saw, what they experienced in, in Watts. And a lot of that started me on the road to seeing that there was this disparity, but also that no one wanted to talk about it. Then fast forward, I did a child adolescent fellowship at Cedar sinai on the other side of the track, so to speak. It was Beverly Hills. We consulted at Beverly Hills High School. Uh, and you would see uh, a different type of trauma related to those kids, even though they were well off and that sort of thing, but they still had, had traumas associated with other things. So it started to kind of come together for me. Then uh, we started seeing uh, Holocaust survivors this was a predominantly Jewish hospital, Cedar sinai and they would come and do what's called grand rounds. And during those grand rounds, they would tell their story. And it just started clicking with me and some of the, uh, the residents there that it's something about the story that we don't talk about that is passed on genetically through generations, three, four generations. And the kids are actually responding to some of those stories, even if the story is not told in the family. So for instance, uh, if someone had survived the Holocaust, there's a great grandparent, and uh, they didn't talk about it, but you have a great grandchild that has symptoms of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, where they're feeling like they're suffocating. Uh, women that have said that they feel like they're being gassed, that sort of thing. And these words were very important, and it's a therapist out in San Francisco that wrote a book about, about that population. So I emailed him, you know, with this day of social media, and instantly he got back with me and said, I said, well, what about the, the slavery experience? Would that be considered a trauma? You know, to me it was. And he said, certainly. And he had referred me to certain articles, and there's now studies being done at Mount Sinai and several uh, places around, around the country and around the world looking at post-traumatic stress disorder and its relationship to the slave experience. So we fast forward that, you know, this family trauma, if you don't talk about it, is the big part of this. And, it, and it's just a matter of people keeping those secrets in the family. Sometimes it's not necessarily even going back that far. It could be someone murdered someone in the family two generations back, but nobody talked about it. What's going on with uncle so-and-so? And you find out that that happened, but you know, a grandchild or a cousin is acting out these behaviors, feeling guilty for no reason, getting in trouble. And it's not an excuse to you know, excuse behavior, but we really need to look at why this is going on. And a lot of that is passed on trauma from, from previous generations. So yeah. genetically, it's genetically. in us, and we just pass, we pass through genetically to the next generation. Exactly. They used to think, we were talking earlier, that. Mm -hmm. When a child is born, it's sort of white clean. The genetic material is kind of white clean, and you start off anew. Now they're seeing that it's ne not necessarily so, that something in the mechanism of passing that on, maybe it's for survival of the, you know, that, that individual, that's actually passed on genetically. They've done animal studies to show that. Uh, the what is it, the um, World Trade Center, individuals that saw the World Trade Center, you know, the, on TV, it was you know, 24 seven there for two to three weeks. Right. Okay. Women that were pregnant, their kids suffer three times more uh, symptoms of PTSD just by had, watching that, the Twin wow. Towers. So something's going on genetically. You know, they, they weren't there, they were in the womb. But this is, is, is starting to really get a lot of research and attention. It's also one of the tenets of Dr. Joy uh, DeGruy's concept of post-traumatic slave syndrome. Yes. Um, we are generations outside of slavery, right? But this idea that it can be passed down from generation to generation, and when you combine that to um, sustained exposure to microaggressions and racial tensions um, in your everyday life, mm -hmm. modern day life, um, it can still have the same kind of impact. Yes. It's still trauma. So, you know, it's, it's a common, uh, 
phrase people to say that you know you have to move on from mm -hmm. slavery and why you still talking about these things but what we're saying here is there's actually some medical background that states that, that yes. those things that happened 400 years ago is still ingrained in our very dna and it, it does pass itself down to generation and generation uh now you know that's probably be uh, inconvenient for some people uh, <laughs> what have you seen as far when the, these studies came out hmm. what was the feedback that you the two of you have seen about you know the post-traumatic slave syndrome what, what kind of things did you see so i can tell you recently <laughs> <laughs> okay recently and i and i'm laughing now because it almost surprised me how upset i got about it but then i responded quick fast and easy and nipped in the bud i saw a recent post that said something along the lines of the title was um slavery should no longer be a part of the discussion in of modern day race relations in the United States. And I was like, so how are you just gonna, you know, how are you just gonna get rid of That's this whole idea? And then what bothered me the most is that the individual who wrote this post was a mental health provider. So for me, I thought, who are you going to be able to treat? You know, who are you going to be able to provide services to when from the onset you're come if someone comes to you and says, I am the only person of color, black person in my Fortune 500 company, and I'm experiencing this, or I'm the only uh, university student. This is very common now in regards to the um, racial distribution of university students. I am the only black male in my science class in my university, and I'm not getting the mentorship, and my abilities are being questioned, and I can't get paired up with partners to p complete my assignments. All those types of things, if someone like that comes to you and they're experiencing depression or anxiety, and your mentality is you know that you know it's it's that there's something that everyone experiences or slavery has nothing to, to do with that it's a dangerous 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 concept and I think people are afraid to accept and acknowledge that slavery is always going to be a part of the discussion because the remnants of slavery are still very much embedded in the system, uh, systemic inequalities that exist it's the reason why there's so low numbers of individuals you know black individuals in universities certain universities it's the reasons why so many health disparities exist in the black community it's the reason why uh, law enforcement inequalities exist. It's the reason why you know financial distribution of wealth is so off. It's the reason for those things. So if you get rid of slavery altogether, then it, then you're essentially saying that that's on the individual, and that's not the case. Um, so anyone who is saying that you know slavery is not a part of it, um, it very much is part of it because it impacts every uh, everyday experiences for Black people in the United States. But it's also a part of it because what we were just talking about before. That's clinical medical research. Right. that talks about how that trauma is passed down biologically. So when you combine that, again, with the everyday experiences of being black in the United States, of course you're gonna have individuals who are walking around stressed, depressed, and, and anxious, and, and not even recognizing that something's wrong. They just feel like this is what being black in America is. So maybe that, what you just said <laughs> is, is key. <laughs> like, I think most of us are conditioned to just feeling that that's, this is just what being black in America is. Sure. And so if I have this weight on me, then that's just what it is. And it really is something that is clinical, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, yeah. based on the research you were doing, uh, did you see any of the blowback that Dr. Richards was just talking about in the research about Holocaust survivors? You didn't see as much, you know, and a lot of that, I think we are bombarded with these stories of the Holocaust. Rightfully so, right. and uh, particularly in Hollywood, in the entertainment community. I could set a predominantly Jewish hospital. Uh, you know, some of even some of the residents were saying, "Well, why every grand rounds? Why aren't we talking about depression or anxiety? Why is it these survivors?" But when you talk to the grandchildren and, and people that are in positions, they say, "We will always tell that story, so you will never forget." Right. And it's the story that I think helps people heal. Uh, there is an individual, he's deceased now, Joseph Campbell. He used to teach at Sarah Lawrence, and he is responsible for at least recognizing that most cultures have what's called the hero's story, the hero's journey. If you look at pretty much every successful movie, 
it's that same story told in a different way. And uh, it kind of was a revelation for me reading some of his, his works. But if you look at African culture, if you look at Latino culture, if you look at European culture, go back centuries, same story. And you tell the story and it's about conquest and you know, going out and making your own way. It's a good story. People go to the movies and they see Star Wars or they see The Matrix or you know, Harry Potter, same story. So telling the story is, is very important and I think we don't want to talk about it. You know, we, we, we really don't want to talk about it. I've, I've had pushback even at some of the hospitals when I would do this for hospitals just to talk about the disparities and would bring up racism white supremacy, that sort of thing, and, and you'd get this pushback. Well, why do we need to talk about that? Because it's the, the victim and the perpetrator, and their ancestors both can heal from that. See, people think it's just about right. us and, you know, oh, poor this person, but everybody heals from hearing the story, Absolutely. talking about the story, getting the story out, and people will come together as a conversation. We always, like, like you were saying earlier, we have a, an incident that happens, it hits CNN and we talk about it for two, three days and then we're back to entertainment or something else that, that comes in. And then another incident happens and then we, we talk about it for two or three days. What are we going to do about the black-white relationships? Now you don't hear anything about the cop killings or any of that anymore at this point. So we, <laughs> right now, until the next story comes up. But it's the story. And this guy's book is, it didn't start with you, Mark Woolen. And he talks about how to heal is to talk about the story. You know, yet three centuries at least, or 500 years of, the, of a horrible Holocaust that's not talked about. And a lot of stuff that I grew up in Baltimore that we didn't talk about that happened. And, and, it, and I know that if I'd have known that story, it would have been a different perspective for me. It was 1988 before I started really looking into it for myself. Uh, and, we're in Los Angeles, there was a, a weekend, every Black History Month they had a, what they call a, a weekend to know yourself. And the radio station would show or, or play all these different um, scholars, it was about post-traumatic slave uh, disorder, these sort of things would come on and I, I'd be writing the work and I'd, I'd listen to it and it just started getting you to the bookstore and looking up these books by these different folks and they're, and they're of all colors writing about this subject. And so for me, it's, that's the key. Talking about it, uh, you know, not to the story of just sort of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and just being strong and you don't have to talk about your depression, particularly for men, particularly African-American men. You know, we're, we're tough, you know, we just don't. Saw it in Latino culture in, in Los Angeles where the machismo, you know, you're, you're tough, you don't, you don't come and talk about your, your sadness or your anxiety but it's acted out. Many of the shootings uh, with the gang violence in Los Angeles were really forms of suicide. They knew that they would get out there and come up against the LAPD and they knew they would get shot. And I talked to some of those kids prior to a couple of them that had passed before they had done that, that they really didn't care, didn't see themselves living past a couple of weeks. So it really wow. just doesn't you know, and you, you try to probe in there why, why, and you know, all the stories of single parent family and all that kind of stuff, but there was something more to that. So that's, that's what started me on this road of just sort of looking out, you know, looking it up for myself and then trying to share that with people that are really willing to accept that that's a way to heal. And I think sometimes people, they underestimate the power of storytelling, right? And we were yes. talking about this earlier, is that storytelling really was at one point a part of our culture and our history is how we sustained ourselves. Storytelling was very much a part of African culture. Right. Um, it was very much a part of w how we sustained ourselves through slavery, whether it was storytelling through song, storytelling through, um, you know, quilting is something yeah. that is inherent um, as far as uh, uh, Alabama culture. Storytelling story just to maintain and sustain ourselves somehow I believe during a time of segregation and then desegregation, we lost that concept. Absolutely. But storytelling is what we need to kind of move past some of these internalized ideas that we have. And those internalized ideas are those expectations that we somehow placed on ourselves. And I think it was kind of a way of protecting ourselves from the you know hostile environment that we were having to operate within. This idea that we have to be strong all the time. 
It's unrealistic. Mm. This concept that men don't cry, unrealistic. This concept that black women have to be all things, all people, which is where we even got the idea of no more martyrs. This idea of martyrdom um, is very much a, a, a component of black feminist thought. This idea that you work and give and give until you, there's nothing else to give to the point of killing yourself um, in service to others. Um, and we celebrate that. And that's not anything to celebrate. Um, so, you know, and we internalize these ideas of, oh, you know, our ancestors overcame slavery, our ancestors overcame um, Jim Crow, our ancestors. You don't know how many of our ancestors lost their minds during right. that time. You don't know how much, how many ancestors, you know, didn't make it. You don't know what that trauma and that experiences was like on them. So why try to use that as a reason to not acknowledge our own trauma and our own need to take care of ourselves? So um, a big part of being able to do that is storytelling. If I have something going on, I should be able to come to you and tell you that that's going on. And then you need to be able to hear me. You know what I'm saying? Believe people when they tell you and not go, oh, girl, you just need to go pray that That's off. the important part. You know, you just go, go pray part. about it or man, you better man up or any of those <laughs> things, you know, like, right. and, those, and those are the things sure. that we do. We sure. do. We kind of brush off or, you know, brush it off like it's not allowed somehow to, to, to be experiencing these things. And I've seen it in the research I've done in the research. And you're talking about not talking about these things. When I um, was doing research on the experiences of black female college students, and this was at universities within the Southeast, um, you know, there were young women who were experiencing depression and anxiety to the point of dropping out of college, right? Nice. And so they go home yeah. and they're like, you know, mom, dad, I've been dealing with this. I didn't want to say anything, but I just don't think I can make it anymore. And you know what happens? Oh, you know what? Your auntie takes the antidepressant. You know, your daddy has been taken, you know, it's, it's generationally a part of the family history and it's never been talked about, right? But if it was cancer, we would know. If it was diabetes, we would be mindful of that. We would know to look in that, into that when we go get our checkups, we'd be mindful and be aware of the fact that that's a part of our history, right? A part of our health and family yeah. history. But we don't talk about mental health in the same way. So when someone's experiencing something, they think it's on them, it's their fault. And I don't want to disappoint or burden anyone, so I'm mm -hmm. going to keep it to my myself but that's where the storytelling part comes in we need to tell what is going on we need to talk about it we need to share it with others and then when we do put it out there as a community we need to rally around that person and not shame them right. and i think that's the important thing mm -hmm. we'll go a little bit more in that just a second but just a quick uh, note for people who are watching us, you can actually ask questions if you'd like. Uh, YouTube Live has a chat option. You can type in questions you might have for the panel. And also on YouTube, on uh, Facebook Live, you can give us some comments and we'll be able to share those. Uh, I will probably need counseling from the PTSD. I'm forgetting the four little girls' names earlier today, especially since I've talked about them incessantly for 17 years. <laughs> but I'll get over it. Um, so we'll get back into this. Uh, we had a program before this at the church, and uh, Sarah Collins Rudolph, who was Adam A. Collins' sister, and that's probably the name I forgot earlier, uh, was there with her family. Mm -hmm. And while I, we were doing the reflection, and just looking at the, the kind of weight that she's had to uh, carry, and so this is going to lead me into our next conversation. We have things that happen to people. You know, uh, I'm not a therapist, obviously, but I know that part of what Sarah Collins Rudolph might be co co uh, holding is survivor's guilt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how do you think that plays into some of the trauma that we're seeing now with people who, you know, the people, the guy that was with Michael Brown, you know, uh, the folks who were in the area when things have happened. Uh, Trayvon Martin's father was waiting for him to come back from the store. Uh, sure. What do you, what are your feelings on those things? Where maybe if I had done this, or maybe if I had come home earlier, uh, what does that kind of affect? Because of, you, there's the regular loss of the loved one, but sure. then there's also that responsibility that they they might be carrying with them that they you know they might not be doing anything about it, mm -hmm. but it's still there. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think it's grief, and, and certainly in grief. That's very common to have you know, survivor's guilt. What if, you know, the, you know, I should have done this earlier, or you shouldn't, I shouldn't have sent him to the store, or you know, whatever the um, the particular um, situation is. That's a common thing for for anyone to go through. I think it's exponentially more significant when you look at severe trauma, people that uh, maybe witnessed a, a lynching, 
Uh, I had a, uh, one of my supervisors in Los Angeles lived in Florida for years, and he said his father was a the country uh, doctor in Florida, but they would bring folks that were lynched, and he had even witnessed a lynch. The effect that it has on you psychologically, and he al always wondered what effect it had on the little white kids that were taking the you know it was like a show, and you would see that lynching, and you know people would take souvenirs and all that, you know, what, what effect he would, he would talk to us about that. I could, again, as I said earlier, I think it affects both. Um, but there is something, yeah, survivor's guilt, you do see that. A lot of that, the intervention, the earlier you intervene in any kind of post-traumatic stress situation, even with Afghanistan and Iraq, a lot of those uh, veterans don't get the help immediately. And if they don't, months, years later, is a chronic post-traumatic stress that happens where these symptoms and they get worse and worse and worse. But a lot of it is early intervention. Talking about the story, the, the tendency for any kind of grief situation is to shut down. Right. Lost my grandmother, I don't want to talk about it, it's too painful. The key to healing is to actually talk about it. And I get my patients to tell me about your grandmother. You know, what did she do? Is she the cook in the family? What was her favorite thing that she cooked? Well, she liked to do apple pie and it was the best apple pie well, was who take who's taking that up in the family for the, the next generation to get them to see that she didn't yes physically she's gone but her spirit is still around and we need to talk about and celebrate you know in the African African culture we talk about that in African American culture we celebrate it's a celebration it's not a, a sadness so to speak so we have to to do that you know we honor them I said well you do something in the, your grandmother's name uh, every year, or you do something for her birthday, but if you're if you're socialized to not talk about it, that you know, suck it up, <laughs> man up, <laughs> then it, it actually hurts you more. Over and, and over generations, we just don't talk about. It. If I could, I could tell you a story. I can't tell you names, but obviously, there was an individual who she actually feels like her father was at least knowledgeable about what happened at the church. White, female. She never really, I don't know if she was called to testify or whatever, but suffering from anxiety, was a professional. But she remembers this day as a kid where he came home from a meeting and she said he just looked differently and looked stressed and she wondered what you know, was wrong and he kind of just shut her up really quickly and said, go to bed. And then the next day, this happened. You know, I don't know, you know, and I'm sworn to confidentiality and all that, just sort of, but, but it affected her. And, it, and in her work, she, she works with, with kids. Uh, she tries to do her best, but it, the guilt of possibly even thinking that he had something to do with it or had knowledge of it, and why didn't he do something? So it's that kind of stuff. You know, and, and I have a, a, a young lady that I used to see, an older lady that uh, was treated, when you talked about diversity and, and um, disparity treated horribly in one of the hospitals and I, you know African-American female and I said well you know what's going on and she was real distrusting of me and we found out she was one of the the, the, the young ladies that was the dogs were sick on during the and said you know I, I fought for this country in, in, in a sense you know, I, you know I was I was there and to be treated this way and you know she was just so distressed about how she was treated you know now that there are diversity in the hospitals but she said this this particular physician did not recognize her as being knowledgeable or being an, you know an African American that she didn't know what she was talking about just horribly disrespected you know and I had to sort of acknowledge that you sh you know you shouldn't have been disrespected you know I respect the fact that you went through something that so I could be in this position to be a physician <laughs> you know looking at it that way and, you know you 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 change that story around you give them a, a different narrative and that's a big help for people that are going through you know some of the, the survivor guilt that you know you are here in the name of that person to do something great and, and, and that's your and that's your perspective and to put that out there and really, only the individual who is experiencing the trauma should be able to name the trauma for themselves. So in any, in any particular situation, so say you have a scenario where um, 
you know, there's a couple walking down the street, man and woman, and all of a sudden they see a guy run down the street and he has a gun in his hand and a police officer running behind mm -hmm. him. And then the thief turns around and pulls a gun on the cop and the cop shoots him, right? All four of those individuals, and he survives, so the thief survives. All four of those individuals have experienced trauma. The right. cop has now had to fire on someone. That's trauma in law mm -hmm. enforcement. Even though you're trained to do those things, it's still trauma when you're actually mm -hmm. having to, you know, be in a situation where you're forced to use your firearm or use any, you know, that level of force. If you're a thief, you're on the floor shot, you're about to go to jail, and you'll get treated, and you know, that's trauma. The man and woman walking down the street witnessed all of that. That's trauma. So this idea that there's only one particular trauma, it's only trauma if you experience it, or you know, if you're the one who was shot, or you know, trauma is, can only be named by the individual who's experiencing that. So there's this idea that I don't, who, who am I to feel this way? You know, there are other individuals who have so much worse than I do. It, we, you don't need permission to feel how you feel. You just need to uh, have a safe space where you're able to argue. You, sure. you, 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 you have to have a safe space where you're able to articulate your, um, your, your pain and your trauma. So you don't need permission to feel any right. particular way. But we, you know, especially within the black community, there's this idea that you're supposed to, to, to struggle in a certain extent. Like I, you know, like again, when it, there's this young lady that I um, interviewed who, you know, and I call her when I, when I talk in different groups, I refer to her as a modern day Seely, right? Off of Color Purple. Oh. She had been molested by male and female relatives. Um, she got pregnant in high school, became promiscuous, got uh, pregnant, miscarried, didn't tell a soul. Got into college, became, um, you know, began experimenting in drugs, uh, started to steal, um, you know, and then started to get into physical altercations. She was someone who was, you know, so angry, but when she sat with me, she cried for four hours. Wow. And what she kept saying was, there are individuals who have it so much worse than I do. And I'm sitting here thinking, You've been through so much, <laughs> yeah, right, and you're still no. sitting here thinking, who am I to feel like this? Yeah. I don't understand why I feel like this. And she had never seen a counselor, you know? And it was just like, what makes you feel like it's okay? Like you're, well, I'm in college. I made it to college. I've made it this far. I'm, I'm okay. I can do this. I can make it. You don't have to try to push your way and force your way through life this way and feel like you don't need support. You clearly, you need support. Um, and so to be able to talk to someone like that, but for me, that's the perfect example of, you know, this need to be able to um, to give yourself permission to, to 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 express your vulnerability, but also to say I need help. Yeah. You know, for her, it wasn't trauma. This was everyday life. This was it is what it is, and people have it worse than I do in her perception. Um, but to really say no, this is trauma. To say no, this is hurt. And regardless of what anyone has ever experienced in their life, this is what you experienced. How are you? Able, how are you handling it? Because clearly, what you're telling me is that you're not handling it well. And so maybe seeing a provider, seeing a mental health professional, could actually be beneficial to you. And so for her, there was that apprehension and that fear and that you know. But we were able in that moment to call someone together and get her scheduled. So this idea that you know you're not worthy or worth that or somehow you have to keep fighting through life. Fighting through life is an exhausting, exhausting thing to commit to and you don't have to. How much of this is an American thing? Like and, uh, our experience here, you know, <laughs> okay. I think you know where I'm coming from. Okay. <clears throat> our experience here is so much different hmm. than the rest of the world. And so some of this is just being a black person living in the country, but how much of that American culture of run, run, go, go, do be strong uh, feeds into this? Because we look at South Africa, the Truth for Reconciliation program that they did right after apartheid. Uh, not, not saying they didn't have problems after that was sure. over with, but they went a long way to telling a story. And both sides, as you mentioned earlier, Dr. Nelson had a chance to kind of move. <laughs> Uh, how much of this is American culture pushing this, well, I don't need therapy, uh, situation? Because it's compounded by us, as you mentioned, trying to be strong, trying to feel like we got to do everything for everybody else. And even when stuff is bad for us, feeling like somebody has it worse. Mm -hmm. So anybody want to jump in? Well, you know, it's a, it's, it's a double consciousness kind of thing. I mean, I think America is a unique country that prides itself on the, you know, the bootstraps and, you know, you make your way and it's the individualism. 
what I do when I uh, teach the residents is that there are two, um, there are other cultures that don't see it as individual. That it's the group that helps you get through things. So I think that's part of it. Uh, that you, you build yourself up, you're the individual. Uh, the power is in the, the object and obtaining that object, and you know, whether it's a job, whether it's money, fame, that's kind of the Western kind of way. Not necessarily negative, but different than some other culture. So imagine if you've come from a culture that's different in the way they see things. And I've talked to Native American folks who said to me, one said to me, you guys wanted to, to join this. <laughs> We <laughs> did not. <laughs> and maybe right. that's why the reservation, even right. though it's a lot of problems on the reservation, that we could, that, that's another whole show <laughs> to talk about. But a lot of that, the Western sort of way, is to, to kind of say, well, there's something wrong with that person. I haven't met a normal person yet, <laughs> and I've been doing this for 30 years. You know, quote, unquote, normal. Right. Everybody could use some help. You know, there's stories, and everybody's family, mine's included. I had the benefit of a program that encouraged us to have therapy. If we're going to help somebody else, we got to know what we're doing and feel the way they feel to help somebody else. A lot of programs don't do that now. That's kind of been pushed, pushed to the side. It's, you know, write a prescription and you'll feel better. But a lot of that, I, you know, I try to get the residents back to seeing that, you know, everybody has a story to tell. You know, we are not alone with that. And it, if you listen enough, you'll hear it. That construct, let me call it a constructive narrative. What's your story? I always ask my patients, what's, what's your story? You know, what, what happened that got you here? Why do you feel you're being discriminated at work? What's the story there? How can you handle that? You know, do you get another job? Can you get another job? Can you handle what you're going through? So a, a lot of that is just sort of, yes, it, it's a cultural thing. I mean, I can give you an example of ADHD. In Europe, you don't see as much of the ADHD, is 11% of the population here in Europe is it's much less. So is it we're more mentally ill <laughs> in Europe? I don't think so. <laughs> I think it's a cultural thing where we're taught to, you know, medicate this. It's, it's an individual, you know, move up. If something's wrong, it's that individual, but it's nothing to do, to do with me. We're getting away from that. You know, people aren't, you know, people tell me every day, people aren't as empathetic. In, in high school as it used to be. You know, you would see that kid that would take up for the bully, you know, to, to, to a kid that's being bullied and that sort of thing. You don't see that as much. So I agree with you. I think there is some cultural uh, differences that we need to talk about. UAB is very diverse in the, uh, in the psychiatry department, and they had a couple of uh, residents from Nigeria. And they talked about colonialization is also mm -hmm. an issue. So yeah. they went through a different experience, but it was still an experience that had something to do with another culture dominating their culture and, and, the, and the ideas to get back. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm a spiritual person. I think you're shown stuff to, to, to help you along the way. I was, I was rotating through uh, an eye doctor's office in med, med, med school out in Los Angeles after med school, and uh, he was from Korea, and he had a couple of Korean residents trying to be eye doctors, but he kept nailing them about how much they had forgotten about Korean culture, even though they were now in America. He kept saying, you don't remember this, do you? So I said, we used to do this. Do you know what this food is? Mm -hmm. You know, and I kept saying, why is he just mm -hmm. on this guy, you know, these guys all the time? But he was trying, now, you know, looking back on it, he was trying to keep them, yes, you're in this culture, you're going to be an eye doctor, but it's important for you to keep Korean culture going, that this is what we do. This is not what you know, you, you don't do this. The, uh, Randall Robinson talks about the yeses and the noes, that we've, we've lost some of that, what to do. We've lost our name. We've lost the stories, as you were saying. All this, you know, that has been, you know, people try to pass it along, but it's getting less and less. You know, the generations are dying off, and people aren't telling the story. So I try to find out in my own family, well, why did so-and-so do this, and what's going on there? And I think that's, to me, I think that's the key. If we don't keep the story alive, because it's really storytelling, mm -hmm. and if you can do that, I think I think the healing will, will come. So I hope I answered your, your no, question. You yeah. Okay. Would okay. you like to add something before we move on? I, no, I just I love what you're saying about the storytelling. As you were speaking, I started thinking about it being kind of like a pendulum swing, mm -hmm. and I feel like there is, you know, is it American? I don't know. 
I, but I do see that there's this idea of fierce individualism mm -hmm. um, and a um, celebration of busyness yes. and money, yes. right? So yeah. if we're going to stay busy, we're going to make that money, um, there's no time for the human mm -hmm. interaction that's necessary to foster environments where right. storytelling would be valued, right? But I do see that swing in, in um, it, and if you could just think, you know, about some of the shows that are coming out. And what made me think of that is the Queen Sugar, um, yeah. which is, uh, is it uh, on, on the Oprah channel, on the O channel, yeah, maybe, so. um, and it's, uh, is it Ava DuVernay who directs that, who's a phenomenal storyteller. Mm -hmm. But in the very first two episodes, um, you know, there are these siblings and they're trying to bury their father. And one of the siblings, you know, came from LA, you know, it's coming back to the country and the other siblings who were there in the country are trying to organize the, the service and the repast mm -hmm. and everything. And they're frustrated in that the sister from LA wants to, uh, you know, have the event catered. Mm -hmm. And then the other sibling who's there mm -hmm. in the South says, how did you forget how to do this? This is not how we mourn. This is not right. how we respect the dead. We respect right. them by serving people with our hands, food that we prepared ourselves. And it's just this phenomenal scene that, you know, had me in tears, but it was a phenomenal scene of how we used to do things. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm seeing that swing, yes. you know, yes. um, in, I mean, you know, I'm seeing it amongst the professionals um, that I interact with on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. This idea of, yes, we have our education, we have our careers, we have our homes, we have all the fixings, right? But we need to step back and recognize that we need more time with our families, more mm -hmm. time to contribute to our community, more time to listen and support right. each other. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I feel like there is that swing. So yes, is an American thing, and eh, yes, to a certain extent, but I think it's also, there's a swing back and a fierce, um, um, you know, commitment or recommitment rather to the customs that have been inherently a part of who we are as black people. And when I say yeah. black people, I'm talking about the diaspora, right? Because right, my family is from Jamaica, yeah. you know, and so my family is, you know, Jamaica, Cuba, Guyana, the, mm -hmm. but there's a whole concept of family, of community, of, you know, diaspora and, and commitment. Right. And, and that's where things like story storytelling and healing will take place. I feel like there's a move, there's a shift that's taking place there. Um, and I think that, that shift is also a part of some of the activism that we're seeing, you know, whether it's a Black Lives Matters movement, mm -hmm. Or is there are actually some reconciliation circles that are taking place here in the U.S. that yeah. speak specifically about racial trauma. I've seen some of that work in coming coming out of D.C. Um, so there are these conversations in D.C. and Baltimore. Right. Yeah. Right. So there are conversations like that taking place. Um, so yes, there's there's it's there, but there's also some pushback. Yeah, I think those things those are the things that need to be highlighted. Yes, those conversations <laughs> because. Um, Bringing up the truth and reconciliation uh, thing in South, America, uh, South Africa, mm -hmm. I know those conversations are happening mm -hmm. here, but it's just one of those things where that does not come up to the forefront. Absolutely. But you know, right. let somebody get shot in, in Baltimore, yeah. right. <laughs> and then sure. we'll have a whole sure. other situation. Um, we're coming close to time here, and I want to thank y'all for uh, all this information. There's probably somebody who's watching this broadcast on YouTube right now or after the fact they're going to see it when it's living on the site mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. maybe a month from now for those people who might be dealing with something right now no matter what it is with you know, trauma or something that happened to them when they were younger or even some of the things that are happening now and it's affecting them in a way and they're not exactly sure how to handle it what's what is the the thing you want them to take away what's the, the piece of advice of advice that you have uh, for somebody who's watching out there who might be dealing with this very topic. Do you want to start first? I would not? say, um, you know, committing to self-care in all of its various forms, including the use of utilization of mental health services, um, is something that you should do unapologetically. Um, that's, that's something that we promote very much through No More Martyrs, is that unapologetic self-care, redefining strength, right? Because there's this idea that you have to be a strong black woman, but what does strength mean? Strength doesn't mean I have to work myself to the bone and then drop dead at a young age. Strength means I can be and do and contribute what I want to the world, but I'm also sustaining myself because I'm no good to anyone else if I'm not loving and treating and taking care of myself. Um, so this idea and concept of, of, of fierce, unapologetic self-care, but also that, um, Advocacy, for, well, for me, 
mental health advocacy can sometimes look like activism. And what I mean by that is it, it causes and induces stress and anxiety to be able to sit back and say, I'm experiencing this injustice, but actually can contribute to your health if you're doing something about it. You know, if you're just sitting there and festering in it, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, this is so unfair. This is, the school zonings are inequitable. Um, I can't get this promotion at work. Male, you know, my, uh, as, a, as, a, as a black female, the racism combined with sexism that I'm experiencing is, is impacting me, my life in these ways. Um, if you, it, it can actually contribute to your mental wellness if you're doing something about it. So whether it's being involved in your school board meetings, your PTA meetings, or your community work, or some level of activism or advocacy or community organization work um, can actually sustain and make, you know, contribute to your mental well-being. So don't be afraid to commit to those types of things as well. I would say, and I would add, acknowledgement of what happened. And, uh, is um, I've seen, you know, the, just the acknowledgement that something has happened and it may not be like this book says, it didn't start with you. So that's the first step. We live in a wonderful age where there's Facebook and all that, so the information is there. When I started looking for stuff, you know, there was the bookstore you went to <laughs> and you might find somebody that did a tape and, you know, you called somebody and said, well, you got a tape with so-and-so's lecture or, you know, uh, post-traumatic slave syndrome or Francis Welsing. Now you can just YouTube and see the whole lecture. So the information, gaining that knowledge for everyone, just to, to get the knowledge, because a lot of times you don't get it in, in your educational experience. Absolutely. And then just realizing it's, it's, if you can, I tell kids, talk to your best friend. Talk to that uncle that you like to talk to. It doesn't have to be the mental health professional unless it, you know, it's really serious, but at least talk to someone. You know, there's no reason for a kid that feels like they got to, hurt themselves or not want to be here. You know, there's somebody you can always talk about. You know, suicide is a, is a permanent solution to a temporary problem is what I tell kids, that you can talk to someone and find out that there's an, there's an option. You have your whole, you know, one kid told me, yeah, I said, he said, I never thought of it that way. I'm 17. I said, what do you think the next 17 years will be like? Maybe it wasn't a great first 17 here on the planet, but next 17 could be great. And that's that hero's story again. That you know, this is that bump in the road, but let's take it further. You might be able to go back to school and do this. You know, there may be a scholarship out there for you. What are you good at? You know, that sort of thing. What was your dream? What, was your, what did you imagine being? So don't let this 17 years stop you from the next 17 years. But it's very difficult, like I said, for people to, to wipe that clean if they don't know their story. They have to have knowledge of their family history, of their ethnic history and what has happened. And I think we don't want to talk about it. And I think that's, to me, is the key. Get the story out there. And I think it's very, very helpful. And there's also education. So this will be my shameless plug, yeah. right? Go for so, it. <laughs> so um, No More Martyrs received a Community Health Innovation Award grant. Um, and that was from the One Great Community, which is a part of the Center for Clinical and Translational Science, which is attached to UAB School of Public Health. Um, and through that grant, we're able to offer free mental health first aid training through churches in the Birmingham area. We're actually working with St. John AME, which is right down the street. It's within the Civil Rights District, right? Sixth Avenue Baptist Church and Ephesus Seventh Day Adventist Church. We're offering that free training. And that's a training that, you know, cost anywhere from $50 to $100 per person. And we're able to offer it for free uh, through those churches, specifically in Birmingham. And we, when we wrote that grant up, we, we wrote it uh, specifically to work through churches because everything churches have been in Birmingham throughout history, and specifically the history of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And we just felt like it was a great place to get individuals educated and aware of what mental health is and how they can support each other um, and encourage individuals um, and even themselves to take advantage of services and move towards and commit to um, treatment plans and recovery. Um, so my shameless plug is that you can look us up um, on our website and on social media. We have those trainings. We have one that's taking place tomorrow at Sixth Avenue Baptist Church. Um, and that also, when this grant ends, which will be next year, we'll be offering that training in different cities um, across the United States. So we'll be doing different right. meetups. We have some meetups scheduled for Miami and Phoenix. Um, we're planning to be in DC at the end of October. So, um, you know, No More Martyrs, it's, we're really positioning it to be a national and international nonprofit 
headquartered in Birmingham, Alabama, by the way. <laughs> and um, we really want to uh, get the word out. And this is a training, it's an evidence-based uh, mental health awareness and education training program that's gotten a lot of support. Um, Michelle Obama had, uh, has participated in a part of the training and is very supportive of the things that um, this training can do for individuals. And I've seen firsthand the kind of things it can do um, to get individuals comfortable with you know, utilizing services. And one of the first things we did when we got the grant was train pastors. And that was a powerful thing, you know, sure. to get pastors to understand um, that they need to be able to promote this idea of mental health to their congregation because they're seeing, you know, when the pastor, you go see the pastor after church, they're seeing a lot of different everything. things and oh, you yeah. can't pray yeah. away all exactly. that stuff. You know what I'm saying? Right. You can't use, right. you, and pastors, again, that, that's not, if it's not their training, some of the pastors now do have mental health backgrounds, right. but if, there's, if it's they're not their training, then being aware of what those symptoms look like so that they can then, you know, lead and um, advise their congregation to take advantage of the resources that are available to them. So that's my shameless plug is that in addition to doing those things, you know, being yeah. able to name it, being able to support each other, being able to speak uh, their trauma exactly. and ask for assistance is also to take advantage of training um, and make sure that you're educated and aware of what mental health is, what the symptoms look like and what the support systems um, look like and what uh, and all, where, where they're available within your community. Okay, but you got to finish the shameless plug and give them the website. Oh, sure. So the website is <laughs> it's www.valenrich.com slash no more martyrs. Okay, yeah, we're going to give you the right way. Dr. Yep. Nelson, we're going to give you a chance to. Where can people reach you in town if they'd like to come speak to you? I have an email, rdnelsonmd at gmail.com. And, sure. and, and I have a uh, Artie Nelson website wellness.com uh, is also uh, a way to reach me and so uh, but I'm in I'm in the uh, can't say the phone book anymore <laughs> <laughs> you all <online. laughs> I'm online <laughs> you there you go, there you go. Uh, I want to thank the two of you yeah. for doing this today uh, thank this you. has been very informative and I hope somebody's yeah. been helped by this uh, appreciate you being the inaugural guest well, for thank you these online thank you. community conversations that we're doing at the Birmingham Civil Rights yeah. Institute and I believe and the conversations like this will help uh, get people the help that they need. And just listening to somebody else talk about um, what's out there. We may have helped somebody to solve a problem today just right. by doing this. So uh, thank you for being with us uh, for this community conversation online. Uh, this is, of course, still September 15th, and we'd like to commemorate uh, Adam A. Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Denise McNair, and Carol Robinson, but also Virtual Wear and Johnny Robinson, the two little boys that were killed on this day. 53 years ago as well. And there are people who are still holding that trauma from those events. And there are people that are still holding trauma from the recent shootings that have been happening over the last four years. Well, they've been happening for a while. Now they're just being seen and they're out on social media. There is help. Uh, there is things for us to do. Tra uh, healing from this, from trauma, doesn't have to be something that you're doing on your own. And don't let counseling be a four-letter word in your household. If you need the help, please seek it because it's out there for you. We want everybody to be well. So thank you for being with us. Stay tuned. There'll be more of these coming down the pike. Uh, make sure you visit us at www.bcri.org for more programs. And have a great day. Thank you. <laughs> That's great.